Good evening and welcome. I'm David Wood from the Pacific Science Centre and I'll be your host for tonight's virtual Science in the City talk. Thank you for joining. We appreciate you taking the time to connect with us this evening. Before we get to tonight's presentation, I'd like to share a few bits of information with you first. We've been uploading some of our past Science in the City talks and that includes topics ranging from um, cannabis regulations and testing, robotic pizza production, war in outer space, uh, and our most recent one last year with the Washington State Department of Agriculture about murder hornets. So those past talks, plus a number of other talks, can be found on the Science in the City tab on Paxi's YouTube page. We thoroughly encourage you to check those out following tonight's presentation. We've got some excellent upcoming Science in the City talks too. The next one's going to be next Tuesday at 7 p.m. That's June the 16th. We'll be discussing how human activity impacts the health of our oceans. And we'll also be highlighting some of the changes to our oceans during the COVID-19 era. The title for that talk is Scat Sniffing Dog and the Search for Pacific Northwest Whales. Our experts uh, are Dr. Deborah Giles from the University of Washington Center for Conservation Biology. And her, um, her colleague is a conservation canine named Eva who is a whale poop sniffing dog. And together they investigate the health of various whale species in the Salish Sea, uh, including killer whales. We're also gonna be joined by Kevin Campion and Shaughnessy Schneider, who are from Deep Green Wilderness, who amongst many other things, create excellent nature documentaries. They're gonna be sharing segments from their Right Over the Edge documentary, which focuses on the search for the elusive North Pacific right whale. To stay in the loop about all of our upcoming Science in the City talks and to make sure that you stay connected to local scientists and experts, sign up for our e-newsletter at paxi.org forward slash SITC. That's for Science in the City. So paxi.org forward slash SITC and we'll send you uh, intermittent news about upcoming Science in the City talks. I wanna remind everyone that educational programming like this is made possible in part thanks to the generous support of donors. In the face of challenges like COVID-19 and climate change, science and an informed public are absolutely essential. So if you're able to, and as part of tonight's event, we suggest a $10 donation, and that helps us ensure that curiosity never closes. For more information about donating to the Pacific Science Center, visit paxi.org forward slash support. Okay, moving on to tonight's event. Wildlife are finding remarkable ways to persist in cities and they're redefining what we consider to be nature. Even now during the COVID-19 era, wildlife are adapting quickly uh, to changes in human behavior due to social distancing measures. They're also redefining what we can learn from urban wildlife, and by doing so, what we can learn about ourselves. Uh, so to discuss, we're joined by Dr. Chris Schell, who's, uh, hey there Chris, who's an urban ecologist at the University of Washington, Tacoma, and he's also the principal investigator with the Grit City Carnivore Project. Chris has been featured in a number of great articles. Chris, am I right in saying that you were in the Atlantic yesterday? Yep, so give that article a, a read. He's also been in the New York Times amongst a, a number of other great uh, and fascinating articles. He's a self-described inter, uh, intermediate tarantula handler. So he's so-so. <laughs> and he even created a course titled Recreating Wakanda, a new course on media, science, and identity, which uh, fingers crossed will be offered next spring at UW Tacoma. If you're a UW Tacoma student, you have got to be signing up for that as soon as possible, because I think that's the dream of absolutely everyone. That sounds like a superb course. Um, tonight, Chris will highlight the patterns and processes by which wildlife are adapting to cities. He'll explain why coyotes and raccoons have become sentinels of urban environments who can help us reframe our understanding of viable green spaces, um, obviously locally here in cities like Seattle and Tacoma and elsewhere. But finally, he'll illustrate why their narratives provide another lens on effective environmental stewardship through activism and social justice that, demand, that dismantles structural racism and classism. I wanna remind everyone before we get started um, to please connect with us in the YouTube comments section. If at any time something resonates with you, you have a question, you wanna share a story, you wanna just let us know how you're doing today. We wanna to hear from you. So please leave all of that in the YouTube comment section. After uh, Dr. Shell's presentation, we will get to your questions and your comments and your thoughts during the Q&A. So leave those at any time and we'll try and get through as many of them as we can. 
So I'll stop blabbering on. Without further ado, please welcome to Science in the City, Dr. Chris Shell. Chris, welcome, hey. Awesome, thank you, David, for that awesome introduction. Thank you all for, for having me for, for this talk today. Um, very much am excited to, to still do this digitally with y'all um, and talk to you about our, our great Pacific Northwest wildlife and what they tell us about ourselves and our cities. I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. And for those of you that know me or have heard of me, you know I, I don't play lights on the puppy and baby animal photos. So you're gonna get a lot of baby animals, a lot of cute and cuddly. Um, and I do that on purpose because a lot of the topics that we talk about are very intersectional, they're very deep, they're very tough. So a lot of what we do with the Grit City Carnivore Project and in the Shell Lab is understanding how these animals move and navigate across our cities. Hence the reason that the title of today's talk is gonna be Community and Justice, Urban Conservation and Human Wildlife Coexistence. And I think, let's see if we get ourselves started here. I think in order to start our premise, it's important to give you guys a little bit of a preamble, sort of a synonym that you would see in an SAT, right, or a GRE. And that being here, that social inequality essentially is an ecological issue. Now, for some of you, that may be a, yeah, okay, we already know that, Chris. But for those of you that don't, hang out with us for a little bit here while we explore these dynamics and the connections across our different cities, the wildlife that live in those cities, and how we create cities. And I'm gonna center in and zero in here specifically on injustices and how they shape our landscape, how they shape not only the social processes in society, but also how they shape the natural processes. In order to do that, I'm gonna use an avatar. Of course, for those of you that are Jurassic Park fans, I myself am wearing a Jurassic Park hoodie. You'll know this Adonis of a man, Jeff Goldblum, who famously in the Jurassic Park movie says, life finds a way. I very much liken this to how we understand urban wildlife. Life is finding a way in cities that we never thought possible. And this particular little creature here has been quite a remarkable way and foray into urban systems. Now, mind you, this video right here is being taken at a captive center in Millville, Utah. So it's Northern Utah, about an hour and a half north of Salt Lake City. This is where I did a lot of my dissertation research as a graduate student. And this is one of the puppies that we recorded way back in 2013. So this puppy, we affectionately named him Kal-El. For those of you that are Superman fans, or at least DC fans, you'll get that name, right? Kal-El, Clark Kent, because this dude was the man of steel. Um, I'm maybe about 10 feet away from this puppy. He's about seven weeks old. Normally coyotes are incredibly cautious. They don't normally get that close to you. Now I'm gonna pan over here and you're gonna see the rest of his family. Now you'll notice that, yeah, they're not all at the same distance, but they're pretty far away. They're like, that's all right, Cal, you got this, man. We are gonna hang out in the back. So this question about how are some animals bolder than others? How does it carry forward? How does it essentially go from the individual all the way to a community? has very much piqued my interest for a long, long time. And understanding how the city is structured help us to understand how urban wildlife behave towards us. And of course, even when I stand up and just look straight at him, he doesn't run away, he doesn't shake at all. He just looks at me as if like, all right, so are you gonna give me food now or what? This is not a unknown phenomenon, right? This happens a lot for a lot of other species across the globe. Here I have a photo of river otters in Singapore. Of course, we have raccoons at, gosh, anybody's doorstep at this point, javelina in Arizona and coyotes, right? Coyotes in almost every major US city in North America, moving down to Central America, perhaps by the end of this century, even in South America. So these animals are finding ways not only to survive in cities, but expand their range in unimaginable ways. And as a result, this is essentially changing their biology. These animals are adapting to living in cities. They're, say for instance, dealing with different noise regimes, dealing with different foods, dealing with different light, temperatures, pollutants, building densities, socioeconomic determinants, 
And as a result, the way in which they behave, their physiology, their morphology, the way that they sing, the way that they navigate systems is all changing. The important piece here is that human beings are the primary driver and reason for this. We are both the directors and the audience. The changes that we see that wildlife are making are making them in order to survive in our cities. And then the conflict back is a result of our actions and behaviors, whether direct or indirect in cities that elicits behaviors, that elicits certain species being in neighborhoods more than others. So for instance, I provide again, affectionate coyote photo. This was a photo taken of a particular known animal around Huntington Beach in California. This animal had a reputation for being the pizza coyote. It would get pizza slices from people every week. This is not an isolated case. There have also been instances of wildlife feeding, particularly coyotes in Portland and several other cities across the nation. My soapbox, don't feed wildlife, right? That's a really important piece. If you are interested later, I could tell you the physiological mechanisms behind why that's not advisable, but feeding wildlife oftentimes can lead to habituation, which can lead to more aggression towards people. So these animals, they're finding a way, right? Jeff Goldblum style. And as I said earlier, all of this is important primarily as understanding people and how people influence the ecological and environmental systems that feed back onto the societal systems and go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So we oftentimes talk about these systems as social ecological dynamics. The idea that there are feedbacks in kind between society and the natural biological systems that exist in that society, whether biotic, so living, or abiotic, non-living. And it goes back and forth. Why is that important? Well, I had started talking about coyotes, right? And how coyotes essentially were a gateway for me into understanding how are animals surviving in environments that previously were considered inhospitable. To give you a short history lesson, most ecologists thought that studying urban wildlife was a waste of time in 2001. Fast forward 20 years later, it is on the cutting edge of ecological and evolutionary research. In fact, several of my colleagues just recently published the first book in urban evolutionary biology. So this, we are at the forefront of innovation and understanding ecological systems, especially as a function of people. Why is that all important? Well, climate change, number one. Number two, everything that's happening with the way in which our cities are dramatically changing, it would be weird to not think that these animals are not responding in some way or kind. And in order to understand that process, in order to understand the coyotes, the raccoons, where they are, where they go, what's around them, it's important to understand structure. I say that word for emphasis, structure, and I provide a photo here of cherry blossoms on UW Seattle's campus for a reason. That reason being, I want you guys to go with me on this journey here. The journey being, let's take the journey of the Lorax, right? Follow the trees. I speak for the trees. Have you ever noticed if you walk on one street or even drive on said street for an, a long enough period of time that extends beyond several census blocks in a city that the density of trees and vegetation changes? If you haven't, I would suggest you do that. I do that with my classes all the time. We call it just a nature walk in the city, right? Or even a uh, walk down socioeconomic lane. Why do you think I call it that? Well, this is not a picture in the US, but I can imagine if you were to take several drone photos, aerial of many different cities, you would see something maybe not as stark as this, but it would show very similar trends. This right here is Mumbai. And you're looking at, you probably can imagine, richer parts of, of Mumbai and the slums of Mumbai. I won't belabor the point to ask you which is which, but I will show you something very poignant. Remember. Follow the trees. Look at where those trees are. Compared to, I didn't even have to highlight in green where the trees are on the right. You could already clearly see it. This pattern repeats itself over and over and over again. Not just in India, but in China, in Japan, in the US, in Canada, in Mexico, 
in Brazil. You mention a country that has economic inequality, you will see this pattern. This pattern is known as the luxury effect, which essentially denotes that species richness, so the number of species here, and biodiversity, the relative representation of those species in the environment, are positively associated with wealth. Now, mind you, this is not always the case. Sometimes you can have neutral relationships between economic wealth, right? Wealth or capital and biodiversity, or you can have negative relationships. But the overwhelming majority of the studies have shown this luxury effect. For those of you that are interested in reading, this effect is not just restricted to plants. You can imagine if you restrict the number of trees that are in an environment, you restrict the number of, say, habitats for birds to rest in, or maybe arthropods to create refuges, or maybe even predators that would eat some of the animals that eat the trees. So I highlight a bunch of examples across many different trophic levels, everything from primary producers like our plants to the first consumers, primary consumers, secondary and tertiary consumers, all the way up to mammals, all showing that things like tree canopy cover increases with wealth. Arthropod diversity increases with wealth. Bird diversity, lizard species richness, mammal occupancy, whether or not mammals are there or not, is predicted by how rich a neighborhood is. Not only that, but you start to see luxury effects that extend far beyond just the biotic realm, AKA again, just the living realm of a city. I told you earlier that some of the most formative research showing the luxury effect looks at reductions in tree biodiversity and tree cover as a function of decreasing socioeconomic status. Less money, less trees. That also means increasing heat, increasing retained heat. Why is that important? Well, because low income neighborhoods tend to get much hot hotter due to this urban heat island effect. The urban heat island effect essentially can exacerbate underlying health inequalities for people that already live in those low income neighborhoods. Things like respiratory illnesses or diabetes, hypertension. It gets much harder to deal with those health comorbidities if you're also having to deal with environmental inequities. So the Grid City Carnivore Project started out very much trying to understand how to help wildlife and people coexist in cities. And very quickly, we realized that our ability to detect where wildlife is, is also a way for us to create data that understands what particular habitats across a city represent healthier habitats that have more environmental niches that can sustain more animals. So we not only look at coyotes, but we use our coyotes as signals to look at other species in the area. And we do so very simply by using camera traps. So here is a camera trap in one of our sites that we set up and watch animals as they move past. So to give you a brief rundown of what the design of our study looks like, pretty much we have been monitoring urban mammals and urban wildlife generally since fall of 2018, with anywhere from 29 to 45 cameras set up on these urban to rural transects. So you'll notice that the, there are these pins. Each of the pins represents where a camera is located. And the different color pins represent different color transects. So we normally have our cameras up for a month period in October, January, April, and July to see whether or not there are any seasonal differences in detections, as well as to see whether or not there are any annual differences. So we're doing this for the long haul. It should be noted that if you are interested in this project, it is part of a larger collaborative project known as the Urban Wildlife Information Network that was originally started by Dr. Seth Magley, Liza Lehrer, Mason Fedino, and several others at Lincoln Park Zoo. And we now have about 25 cities and counting that do this very same design, including our partners in Seattle at Woodland Park Zoo, Robert Long and Katie Remine, as well as at Seattle University, Mark Jordan.
So we all are collaborating on these larger camera trap projects to understand the fundamental rules of life for wildlife in cities. One of those fundamental rules being how are they adapting to differences in socioeconomic status as a predictor of say tree cover, vegetation cover and the like. And of course, we don't only get awesome photos on our cameras. We also get awesome photos when we get into the field. I like to make this the slide of it's great to do outreach and community work. There is a community part of the talk in the title, doing community work, getting students, getting the public out into seeing the areas where we put our cameras also means we get a chance to snag some really awesome photos. So we've gotten photos on site of raccoons before staring at us while we set up cameras or red-eared sliders. Uh, we are in all types of sites with students from K through 12 all the way through undergraduate, graduate and postdoc. So it's a great way to get out into the field. And of course, we have awesome photos of animals posing as if it were their class photos. We have photos of animals doing certain behavior. So here we see raccoons walking together in a group. Um, many of these, say for instance, this particular photo was taken a few blocks away from UW Tacoma's campus. I imagine that if we were to do the same and put a camera on Seattle's campus, which one of our collaborators, Laura Prue, has done before, you'll see a whole bunch of other species as well, including coyotes and raccoons. They're all over the place. And of course, the obligatory cute video. Again, apologies for the choppiness. Hopefully you guys are able to see it clearly, but we just recently in this past March got an awesome video of a baby bobcat just perching, hanging out. The joy of cameras is that when you get to a camera, you don't really know what you're gonna get, right? So this particular camera was way out in one of our rural sites near Northwest Trek. And we now know that we have a den, right? A den of bobcats. So we're able to get these awesome videos, not only to see where the animals are, but to see how they're behaving in their environment. So just to give you guys a few prelim preliminary analyses, and, and these really have just hit the press within the last week, I would say, last couple of weeks, is we wanted to investigate the luxury effects for our urban mammals. So we just looked at spring 2019, because those were the data that we had tagged. We had a lot of students that put a lot of work into figuring out what animals were where and who they were and where they were. And then we just used median household income as a proxy for neighborhood wealth to say, all right, well, let's just see what are the number of species that we detect at each site as a function of median household income. And sure enough, as median household income increases in Tacoma, so too does species richness or the number of species that we detected on a camera. Now, mind you, these are preliminary results. And of course, for say a robust camera study, we not only would want to detect the animals that we did see, but potentially the animals that we didn't see. So one of the things that we're hoping to do is to look at other data into the future to say, all right, is this pattern holding true across all seasons, across all years, even as the landscape is changing? But these preliminary data are promising and also provide us the roadmap to say, we've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of work to create a system in our cities that is ecologically, socially, racially just. So it should be noted that environmental disturbances like pollution, like heat, they are not restricted to people. They don't only affect the people, they also affect the animals. Structural racism and classism create systems that essentially distribute where the impervious surfaces are, distribute where the trees are, which distributes where the heat is, which distributes where the air pollution is, and where the clean versus not so clean water is. All of that is important because it all compounds to influence the ecological and evolutionary processes of organisms in our cities. So for instance, a raccoon living in an area that may be low income, that may be co-located near an industrial plant may be facing the same biological and health constraints 
that those that are living in that area are. These animals, in ways that previously was not possible, are providing an ecosystem sentinel, essentially a mirror for us to understand how we influence our ecosystem and how it influences us. So if you remember, I started off this talk saying social inequality is an ecological issue. And given how I've demonstrated the layers, and we haven't even gotten into, say, for instance, for those of you who may be top of mind, things like COVID-19 and the intersections between race. That has a lot to do with where industrial pollutants are co-located with Black communities, which influences air quality, which degrades respiratory abilities, and therefore makes it more likely for an individual living in that area not only to contract COVID-19, but also to die from COVID-19. These signs from our environment, these symbols that we see in our wildlife and where they are and how healthy our ecosystems are, it's not only important for ecological justice, it's also essentially important for urban sustainability and conservation. If we want to more or less save our planet, stop climate change, Study after study after study has repeatedly shown these effects of the luxury effect, as well as how inequality generates biodiversity loss. If we want to be able to create systems that allow us to combat climate change, we first, as a prerequisite, need to combat structural racism and classism that essentially is killing our planet. Hence, environmental justice as the solvent means that it is in part the prerequisite to doing legitimate urban sustainability and conservation. And that means guarding against gentrification. That means guarding against displacement. That means addressing historical and contemporary ills that not only hurt people, but also hurt wildlife and where they are. So with that, I'd like to close and open for questions. First, of course, I'd like to acknowledge all of the partners that are integral in helping us perform much of this work, especially the fact that we are so transdisciplinary in the work that we do. We span a lot of different fields, not just ecology. We very much lean on the social sciences as well as very much a integral and equal part in a lot of this work and also rely a lot on the students and the community that help us to understand how wildlife are navigating our cities. I'd like to also thank, of course, Point Defiance zoo and aquarium for their contributions as major partners of the grit city carnivore project the urban wildlife information network university of washington tacoma metro parks tacoma our funders and all of the students and community members that have ever helped in tagging photos for us and with that i'd like to take any questions there's my email address and shameless plug for my twitter handle Thank you so much for that, Chris. And, and as you mentioned, we're now going to be moving on to the, the Q&A portion of today. So if you're watching from home again, if you've got um, questions, comments, stories, just let us know what's going on, how you're doing. Um, we want to hear from you and we want to connect that uh, here to Chris. Um, and we will try and get through as many of those questions as we can um, this evening. Chris, I'm going to start how, how critical is having um, active community-wide participation in citizen science projects and, and, and in your work in general? How important is it to get uh, buy-in from the community? Yeah, absolutely essential at every step. Just to kind of give you a flavor of what happens when we're setting up a camera at a particular site. First things first, we talk to the community members about where the wildlife is, but also to get permission. So many of these sites, public or private, we have to obviously get permission to put a camera up there before we do so. And being able to talk with people about what we're doing, why we're doing it, why it's important is, is really critical. So that's the first step. The second step is you can imagine, right, that if we have at our, our maximum 45 cameras up at any point in time for a period of 30 to 45 days, if there was a photo taken, one photo just every day, for every camera, we would be somewhere north of 10,000 photos easy within just a couple of years. I'll tell you right now that we are, because we obviously get more than one photo a day per camera, we're north of 50,000 photos. So <laughs> that means that trying to tag all of those photos 
is near impossible for one faculty member and two students. So a lot of what we're doing is creating infrastructure that's public facing that allows community members to tag the photos with us, right? To be part of the process of seeing the photos. And in some instances, they're able, community members are able to tag photos and say, this photo is really cool. And they see the photos before we even do, right? Because we are uploading the photos and trying to get them online as quickly as possible. So both in terms of getting buy-in from the community and in having community participate in our, in our process, right? In getting the data that are integral to publishing the data, to getting it out to the community, to getting the funding, to working on applied solutions to make communities better. It's all rooted in the community. And, and how do you get community buy-in, um, especially in low socioeconomic uh, areas like you highlighted in your presentation? Um, how does someone get their hands on a camera? Is it something you can rent from the library? Do they sign up for the Grit City project? How does someone who's interested in this contribute to this? Yeah, that's a, th those are all good questions. We have not yet started, say, like a library rental program where you rent a camera and you set it up. A lot of the sites that we've put cameras in have been these public spaces surrounded by urban areas. Um, one in particular park that we put it in, McCormick Park, is not even legitimately a park. It's kind of a concrete area in between two um, commercial buildings that has a little bit of green space with a few trees, but that's about it. And we still get raccoons there. We still get outdoor cats. We still get rats. Um, so in those instances, when we see people, you know, we, we say hi. And if they ask us questions, we certainly talk to them. Um, we have several cameras that are near homeless encampments. And we make it, uh, out, we go out of our way to talk to people in those encampments, to hear about what they're seeing, to let them know the project that we're doing, to kind of allay their fears that we're very much not interested in human detections. Um, and if anything, many of our cameras are pointed towards the ground. So we see a lot of the animals um, and their faces, but we see only the legs of the people that walk by. So very much kind of talking to the community about the project when they walk by, but also talking to K through 12 schools. So we do a lot of outreach with some of our schools as well. I should mention that Point Defiant Zoo and Aquarium shares a building with one of our local high schools in Tacoma. So we very much are trying to make inroads with many schools and communities around our neighborhoods. That also includes schools in Seattle. So connecting with you know, Mark Jordan um, and Robert Long and Katie Remine at Woodland Park Zoo would be a good way also to tap into many of those resources. Thank you for that. We, um, I want to say thank you to everyone who's uh, contributing questions and, and, and giving us comments. Someone just said that bobcat was so adorable. Yeah, right? <laughs> super cute, super cute. Um, I got to ask, what's the weirdest thing you found on a camera chat? We saw some of the most adorable things with that juvenile bobcat. But what are, you got to have seen some, some strange stuff. I know sure. You... <laughs> yeah, I'll try, I'll try and keep it as um, yeah. PC <laughs> as possible. But when you're doing urban ecology, uh, the people are part of the system. So uh, we have sometimes had drug deals happen in front of our cameras. We've had people urinating in front of the cameras. Um, certainly a lot of illicit genitalia pics. Um, we even at one point, which you think people would know that the camera was there, there were people fornicating in front of the camera. So everything and you know we aren't even the worst so i bet if you were to ask many of the partners of some of the other cities they would tell you some incredibly weird horror stories um which is another kind of view or social experiment if you will of cameras getting the wildlife of the wildlife near the wildlife um so breaking however many fourth walls you need to to make that happen <laughs> So it's not all glamorous. It's not all baby bobcats. There's a <laughs> there's a crazy side. Too. Right. Yeah. I get. I gave you all the cute and cuddly, not the um, illicit or near pornographic. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll move on. Thank, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to go to the questions now because we're getting bucket loads. Um, you talked about getting students at various levels out into the field, contributing to this work. Have you had any memorable experiences with these students in these environments? you ever had a, a, just a fantastic experience that sticks in the memory? Oh, there have been a lot, but I, I will say that, um, so this past, oh gosh. Um, okay, so yeah, there was this, so one of the studies that we have been trying to do 
is understand coyote behavior solely as a function of like animals being urban or rural and whether or not they were super bold or not. And we got to one site that was near Federal Way, near Fife. And as we walk through the site, um, of course there, and as is the case in many of the sites that we go to, tons of homeless encampments, tons of um, sometimes unfortunately litter in a lot of our sites. As we're setting up these cameras, um, we very much notice that there are other people watching us. And then they later tell us stories about how that they're, even in sites that have landfills, that there were puppies near the landfills um, and that they were playing near sewer treatment plants. So this one particular site that we went to for this guy, coyote boldness study, it was a site that also had signs where it's being restored, but it was, the sign was riddled with bullet holes, right? So we go everywhere. We are very indiscriminate about where we set up cameras because then otherwise we're not able to get some of those figures that you see. And rather than say, oh man, this site is com completely trashed. It was just one of those things where many of the community members were so endearing and wanted to help out in whatever way they could, which for us was like, we always go out of our way to talk to community members to, so to hear it kind of talk back to us and like, hey, what you're doing is awesome. And I know a coyote was here, a coyote was there. That also paired with story 1B is we, we did a lot of work with the Port of Tacoma as well. And at one point they were restoring a site with chum. So just throwing fish pieces all over the place. So we're walking through one of these sites and there are livers, not just of the chum, but then also of the deer. So you know it's a kill site. And we get to see some of our camera photos and many of the camera photos are every, almost every other day, there's a coyote coming in and pretty much like fast food, taking a piece of the chum and walking by the camera. So it's just, it's classic to just see these animals say, oh, you're giving me free food? Awesome, I'll take that. No worries, I got it. <laughs> so it's multiple stories rolled into one, but um, all about the community and the animals pretty much. Yeah, that's great. And uh, presumably getting some great shots on those, on those cameras with, uh, with the coyotes going by there. Um, so is there another question, getting so many great questions by the way, is there, is there any evidence that urban wildlife may experience high mortality rates due to non-natural deaths? What's the trend? Um, are we seeing more non-natural deaths um, in urban areas or, or do, can you speak to that? Yeah, for sure. So, and I'm assuming by non-natural deaths here, we mean things like um, vehicular mortality or dying from say like um, chemicals or pollutants like that. I will say that the, the most well-known research is on roads and road mortality certainly can be very high for animals that live in cities. If they're not really well-versed in navigating those roads, that falls hardest on many of our native and endemic organisms. So those that aren't really used to being in habitats that are highly fragmented, you see a lot of mortality from those animals as well. The really interesting piece to all of this is that those roads contribute to how the animals evolve. So there have been several studies by many of my colleagues in rats and birds and insects that show that roads actually create distinct subpopulations that evolve as a function of being in a city. One of the most well-known and best examples recently in the last five years was by Jason Munchie South and his lab and his team and his, his students that show that there essentially is two distinct populations, an uptown rat and a downtown rat. And that's due to the function of historical development, mainly driven by roads. You can see the same thing across many other species, but certainly roads is the biggest one. And there are chemical contaminants that also can result in mortalities. However, though there are a few studies, there are some studies showing that certain species develop adaptations and mutations to deal with those particular pollutants. So they may suffer high mortality, then there is a mutation, that mutation confers a benefit to a particular individual, those individuals survive and reproduce, then you don't really notice any difference other than a change in a couple of alleles. So that's, you know, 
threw a little bit of genetics here at you, but more or less, we do see an effect. That effect is early on, you see kind of that getting hammered with the population and then it rebounds back. Building on that, you know, a lot of folks talk about New York City rats. You know, are they, are they crazier rats than, than elsewhere in the United States? Um, and, and obviously the article you were in yesterday in, in, in the Atlantic um, talks about rat population behavior in, in major urban centers. Yep. There's a lot in the news about this. Are, are we really seeing just crazy rats fighting wars and cannibalizing? Is that new? No, uh, rats have always been cannibalists. Um, they do that quite often um, and they do it as a function of how much resources are in the environment. So it just so happens, right? That because they're such habitat generalists, when they're able to subsist on a more or less stable source of anthropogenic foods with some of the other natural foods that they eat like arthropods. Um, so thinking of worms, thinking of beetles, they're okay, right? The, the amount of cannibalism decreases, but when resources get to a certain point, rats can only reproduce so much until they start having to eat each other. And that, that happens. They may also start to try and find other food resources. So as reports have shown, and I myself have not done this research, but this research is all over NPR, is that the location of pest management calls is shifting to be more residential as a function of more commercial businesses and restaurants shutting down. So dumpsters that used to have foods don't have the stable food resources that they used to. So rats are shifting where they are located. Now, mind you, that's not gonna be consistent, right? Like that's not gonna stay the way that it is, but that just goes to show that they're pretty adaptable and they'll do whatever they can to survive. Uh, thank you for that. We got a question. You, you were talking about following the trees. You're going for a drive and you follow the trees and you're noticing differences. Um, are trees the answer? What role does urban tree canopy restoration or mitigation projects, um, such as green walls, living roofs, um, how important are those things in, in urban ecology? Yeah, uh, the cop-out answer is all of it's important. The nuanced answer is that the trees are part of the story. So I purposefully kind of as a Game of Thrones episode, stopped you guys right where we say, okay, so what are the solutions, right? And those solutions are two pieces. Number one is actually talking to community members in those neighborhoods, not only about the benefits of the trees, we don't wanna go in there and parachute science and say, this is really good for you, you need to have the trees. That's not community-based at all, and that's that's not ethical. Uh, the, the thing that we need to do is go in to these communities and listen to what they have to say about the vegetation, about the plant life, about their fears, rightly so, right? Because of repeated history of being displaced, of gentrification, of them losing their livelihoods, of which we didn't even get into the historical underpinnings of why this is all the case. The money is, is only part of it. If you very famously in almost every mobster movie, right? Follow the money. In every detective movie, they always say, follow the money. You, that, that's important because if you follow the money, you follow where the money came from, why it's there, why the trees are there, and who orchestrated all of it. The short answer here is you know, historical legacies like Jim Crow laws and um, the reconstruction era, slavery, 400 years of oppression, all of that, right, all contributed to our modern manifestation of the way in which our landscape is influenced, to the health inequalities that we see in our systems, even to police brutality. It's literally all connected and scales up all the way to the planet. So when you're asking, again, this is a more nuanced answer, what do we do? Creating vegetation cover structures that are community bought in and creating at the same simultaneous time policies that guard against gentrification. Say for instance, creating houses that are affordable forever, right? Into infinitum to allow people to stay there or creating programs that allow people to rent spaces that eventually turns into ownership, allowing people to stay in there and creating generational wealth. That generational wealth from an ecologist perspective is important because it reduces disturbance, which then increases biodiversity. So again, all connected.
how do you um there's a lot of common misconceptions um about urban wildlife um and like you just mentioned there are sometimes a lot of challenges um to getting that community buy-in um for for a lot of historical reasons how do you combat how do you how do you um how do you combat some of those misconceptions and misunderstandings um, about urban wildlife and about some of these projects? Yeah. Um, number one is I talk to my social science collaborators because I am not a trained social scientist. I may have lived experiences as a black man and I'm able to code switch with the best of them. But when it comes to a lot of that research, quantitative and qualitative, there has been a wealth of literature on that. So why recreate the will? Right. It's better to collaborate and talk to the people that have already had boots on the ground, talking to these people and these communities for an extended period of time. I'm as often the transplant. I'm from Los Angeles. Right. So I know my Los Angeles community pretty well. But even then, like I haven't lived in L.A. since I was 18. That's a good 16 years ago. There's been a lot of change in L.A. since I've been there. So there have been people that have been in these environments for decades. And it's, it's humbling as a scientist, I like to think anyway, as a scientist, I have the license to say, I don't know, and I wanna find out. That is, that is the beauty of my, my work. And I think something I would hope a lot of kids that are listening to this, this talk later, or those that say, oh, well, we don't know what the scientists think, or the scientists is like, no, actually, everybody is a scientist. Everybody's a scientist and we repeatedly put together the puzzle pieces over time to create this tapestry, tapestry this, this mosaic that better informs our understanding of things. Hence the reason, you know, we don't jump off of buildings thinking we can fly. We know gravity is a thing on this planet, I'm but really if not. it were, hopefully not. Hopefully nobody on this call jumps off of a building after this and says like, no, I don't believe in gravity. I don't want you to do that. Please don't do that. Um, it's, and that's, that's, again, the beauty of science is, is coming in with a humble and open mind to say, I want to learn. I want to be a lifelong learner. So in that regard, I lean on my collaborators. I learn from my community members. I hear what they have to say. I tell them what I know about the biology. And then we come together with a comprehensive plan. And as you said, everybody's a scientist and everybody can be a scientist now through yep. citizen science. Yep. Um, we got a great question. Can you recommend a good book for the layperson that discusses the intersection between biodiversity and socioeconomic status or race? Um, and if not, have you had any good books that you've been re reading recently that you'd like to share? That, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I will say that a lot of the integration that we've done is built off of a lot of foundation from several other projects that were in Baltimore and Phoenix. Um, they're we call them LTERs, it stands for Long-Term Ecological Research Projects. And many of the authors there have put together publications or books that they may not be readily available, but if you're interested in reading specific authors, people like Paige Warren are good to look up, Sharon Hall, Kevin McGraw. Um, I gotta kind of take a look at my Rolodex here. Um, Stuart Pickett was one of Stuart Pickett and Nancy Grimm were one of the four, um, four parents, if you will, of those two movements, right? They are, they essentially are what we strive to get to and to be. Um, but in terms of putting together all of the pieces, we haven't yet created a completely comprehensive book that talks about all of the, those intersections front and back. There are pieces all over the place that if we were to compile them together, yeah, that would make something pretty substantive, substantive, but it's not completely there yet. So in terms of books, at least on either side, I certainly would suggest um, some books about just belonging in nature and what race does and how it plays a role in that. So Carolyn Finney has a book called Black Faces, White Spaces. That's a really good book of understanding the environmental movement and how the roots of that environmental movement were based in Henry David Thoreau, but also were tinged with, again, who belongs in nature, because as that doctrine was created, it was created in a period of time where African-Americans and indigenous peoples were not seen as people. 
So nature was not for them. They should have been cleansed from nature. So Carolyn talks a lot about that in her book. Um, of course, if you're interested, and I'm sure many of you in the last few weeks have been interested in many of these readings, but How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram Kendi, also a good read to look at. Robin D'Angelo's White Fragility, also a good book on the side of understanding racial oppression and understanding white privilege and how the two intersect with each other. Um, there are several books as well on urban evolution. There was just a book that just recently dropped by um, doctors Marina Alberti and Marta Sokin and Jason Munchie South and all of the heavy hitters for urban evolution. You can find that book. It should, actually, I think it just dropped this past May. Um, so you can take a look at that book as well. And there's several other books um, that are, are easier reads and just fun reads. Um, I think one that says like evolution in the city or something like that um, by Minnow, I think is his first name. I forget his last name. But there are tons of books all over the sphere of what we talked about, but not one solid book that talks about the intersections of all of it from the perspective of a social and natural scientist together. You, you, met, you mentioned um, black faces and white spaces. Yes. Um, and obviously recently there was the recent experiences of Christian Cooper who was um, bird watching in Central Park. Uh, I think that that has exposed an open wound, uh, if you will. I guess if, you, if you're unfamiliar with the event you're watching, it took place in Central Park, which has added significance. It featured a hysteric white woman uh, who is weaponizing the police, it exposed how white people feel ownership over and um, self-police black people and, and, and outdoor spaces. As a black scientist yourself, who's frequently in similar situations where you're traipsing through urban, urban parks uh, in search of wildlife, what, what's, what's, what, what do you take from that situation? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me personally, I oftentimes, when I have the ability to do so, I go out into the field with somebody else. And that's just for my own safety, honestly. Um, I oftentimes, and you guys will see, I'm wearing my biggest of glasses. I will wear a jacket that has the insignia of Point Defiant Zoo and Aquarium and says staff under it because I, I very much am thinking of garb because of the way that my garb would be perceived. So I oftentimes am thinking, all right, well, if I have a, a jacket that says point defined zoo and staff, then they will see me as somebody who has the right to be there. Even though the sites that I'm going to are open public spaces, anybody can be there. And yet we've had instances um, where we've been in public spaces. One very notable instance that I had where we were doing a lot of work on collaring animals in Colorado. And we had an animal that we were processing on the table to give a collar, to do blood work, to make sure that the animal was healthy. And a cop car came up on us with its lights. The animal was anesthetized, but mind you, any loud sounds or bright noises, the animal could instantly wake up. And not only would the animal be in danger, but everybody around us would be in danger. So the powder keg of just having an animal and processing an animal in the field is also something that I'm very cognizant about. So that's also part of the reason why when we do a lot of our work. We're not only talking to people like Metro Parks Tacoma, we're also trying to talk to Tacoma PD. We're also trying to talk to the police uh, at UW Tacoma and where we set up our cameras. So then that way they know, hey, you know, this is Chris Shell and his students. We're, we're trying to survey wildlife. And even then, I, I very much am, am trying to be as friendly as possible to let people know like, hey, this is us trying to understand our wildlife. And that's something that I know uh, many of my other black colleagues do. They do the same um, when they're working in field sites, whether it be urban or rural. And that happens quite often. So we very much are top of mind thinking about it. And at the same time, um, trudging on because it's the work is important, right? It, it impacts all of us. Are those conversations that you have with your students or your collaborators before you go out into the field, and especially for those who are students or collaborators of color? Yeah, all the time. Even, even students and collaborators that aren't of color. Um, I, I tell them all the time, you know, what I'm thinking as I'm seeing these sites. And the reason I do is because, again, we talked earlier about code switching. There are many, um, and I, I personally have pushed my colleagues to do this as well. Many of them have started, many of them have already been doing it, some not so much, is that if we are to make accurate assessments 
of our urban systems and cities and the wildlife that live in them, we can't only look in the areas that are upper middle class. We can't only look in the areas that are high income because we miss an entire area of the city. You would never do that as an ecologist. You would never blatantly just not look at a specific area just because you felt uncomfortable. And because I am black, I feel more comfortable in those environments. So as a result, I'm able to converse with those people and converse with my non people of color colleagues to say like, hey, you know, we are all in this together. And if you were about anti-racist strategies and learning and being about doing the work, which, you know, the work never stops, right? The work will never stop for me until I'm dead. The work will never stop for all of us. Um, so as a result, not only am I a lifelong learner there, but I'm a lifelong learner in how to bring us together as a people. And that means understanding, reconciling our history, our past, and our current situation, and how wildlife, right, the cute and cuddly, like that bobcat video that you saw, they are the link to that. They help us hopefully be better people. You should, it should be noted that like people should help us be better people, but that doesn't always seem to happen. So if wildlife tend to be your gateway, let them show you that they too are also facing the ills of the people that live in that environment. What can, you, you mentioned there, we're seeing parallels um, between wildlife and the way that we interact with each other. For someone who studies coyotes so much, what can we learn from coyotes? What can we learn from this wildlife? Yeah, how adaptable they are, how they are able to learn, how they're using, even when we just see them and they either are running or they're standing still, they are using complex cognitive processes to understand each individual person. Now, some of my colleagues like John Marsla, they've done studies that look at say crows using individual identification. They can ID specific people across the city. And if you were mean to them, they will retaliate. So coyotes do the same thing. They are able to understand and recognize specific people and perform specific behaviors towards those people. Their ability to learn and, and adapt to an ever-changing environment is endearing, is one that in a story recently where I, I talked to people from the UW Magazine, I very much likened to the experience of being black or the experience of being an immigrant, the experience of being indigenous, the experience of being a marginalized or non-majority persons in an environment that wasn't built for you. Finding a way to navigate that system, to navigate that city, to pretty much make chitlins out of pig intestines and make it work, right? That is the way in which coyotes have not only become the staples of our environments, but have infiltrated all of the North American continent. And here's the thing, as our environments continue to change, I, again, gonna use a DC reference here. I oftentimes lean on Marvel, but today is more DC. <laughs> For those of you that remember the good 2008 Batman with Heath Ledger as Joker, there is the line that says like, you either die a hero or you live long enough for yourself to be a villain. A lot of people villainize coyotes, but they are the heroes that we need. They are the apex predators in cities where we don't have apex predators. So they help to regulate, hopefully, right? There's still research coming out to actually validate that, but hopefully regulate different mesocarnivore and prey populations in order to maintain all that species richness and biodiversity. So having a coyote in your backyard is a good thing. That means that your environment, your city is benefiting from these coyotes being in the neighborhood. And yes, that means that they eat the occasional outdoor cat. Yes, that means that my occupational hazard is to tell you to keep your cat indoors for so many reasons, including biodiversity loss, including disease dynamics. Um, and also, right, because it increases conflict with coyotes. So keep your cat indoors. How coyotes help us regulate our environment it gets more environmentally sustainable, more stable, more sound, more just. You mentioned crows there. We got a question about crows uh, from the audience. Do you study crows at all? Those are the ones that we see the most. Wondering how they are doing during these last 15 weeks. I know you're not an avian ecologist, but 
Yeah. So I, I myself don't study crows, but I have, I have good collaborators and friends that do. So John Marslov, I had mentioned his name earlier. He is a professor at UW Seattle on the Seattle campus. Also Kaylee Swift, who is a lecturer at UW Seattle. They both work on crows. They work together. There are some faculty also at UW Bothell that work on crows as well. Um, and they will tell you that much of the behavior that you're seeing is pretty normal, that what you're seeing is not any particular population level change as a function of the stay at home shutdown orders. I will say that you may see an individual or two doing something that you may not have seen in the past, but it also, and this is back to the Atlantic story, is just us now paying attention because we're at home. Um, so there, there is a little bit of both in that story. We're getting, again, we got some, got some great questions. Um, one here asks, should I be a little afraid of coyotes? I know you said it's an honor to have them in your back garden and I agree, but what's the right thing to do if we run into these nice animals in the city? Yes. You mentioned that we should not feed them. Yeah, ab that's absolutely number one. Do not feed them. And study after study and city after city has shown that if you feed, if, if somebody in the community doesn't buy in, say you have 100 people and one person feeds a coyote, that creates habituation to a level that can result in bites and attacks. That happened in Chicago. That's happened in Los Angeles. That's happened in Colorado. Do not feed the coyotes. Do not feed the raccoons. That's first and foremost. Second is, and maybe this is just because I've seen through my dissertation research, through my postdoc, through my faculty position here at UW Tacoma, um, I've seen animals be born. I've seen them be puppies. I've seen them grow up. I've seen them become their own parents. So I myself sometimes see them all as my babies, which is not <laughs> always okay. <laughs> but when I see them, if they start to approach me, and if this is the case for anybody, if they start to approach you, you make yourself as big as possible. You walk towards them, not away from them. If you have a dog, keep your dog on a leash. Do not let your dog chase the coyote ever, right? Keep your dog on a leash, make yourself big. If you have pots and pans, bang the pots and pans. Even if you just see a coyote and the coyote is just laying down and watching you from say 20 yards away, instill fear. The fear keeps them alive. So you want to make sure like, hey, you know, I, I always, I'm like, hey, buddy, you got to go. You know, you can't be this close. So I start banging pots and pans and I walk towards them. I'm like, I love that I see you and I very rarely get to, but you got to go, man. You got to go. So don't, yeah. It, as I know a lot of people are, are afraid of coyotes, especially it's, it's kind of called the big bad wolf effect, right? Like we have this nursery rhyme in our heads that these big canids are very dangerous. They're, they're not. As long as we don't feed the animals, we respect them, and we it's, it's called hazing, not the type of hazing you would think about as, say, like a sorority or fraternity, but hazing as in creating a loud noise, creating a disturbance, so in that way they make sure they maintain distance and everybody's okay. Gotcha. Um, some great advice there. You, you mentioned earlier that uh, coyotes have expanded, uh, have expanded their range across the, the territory, kind of acro across North America, um, if I'm not mistaken, they've made their way down through Central America and have even crossed the Panama Canal, I think 2014. Yep. Um, should we be cheering for our superhero coyote friends as they expand down into South America? Is that a good thing? Or what are some of the challenges that they might face when they get there? Sure. From a conservationist perspective, not necessarily a good thing. No, um, there are several other carnivore species that are in Central America, that are in South America, that now all of a sudden have to compete with an animal that they've never experienced before. That is both an interesting natural experiment and something that if not mitigated can affect those predator populations, which can potentially destabilize some of those communities and ecosystems that already exist. So yeah, sure, in environments like the US where we have done our fair share of degradation to some of our environments, a lot of the restoration work that we're doing, well, coyotes used to be in a good chunk of the Great Plains and now right, are in 
parts of the, the states that they weren't in. So like the southeastern part of the United States. But here's the thing, right? Red wolves used to be there. Um, so we're starting to reintroduce red wolves. And there certainly is a conversation to be had there. But they're not as widespread. I mean, can you imagine seeing a wolf in Florida? I'm pretty sure Floridians probably wouldn't go for that. I would love to have wolves in Florida, but they may not. We also had a subspecies of red of wolves, gray wolves, uh, called Mexican wolves, right? That were around New Mexico and Arizona, but their range is also constricted as well. So they were serving a particular ecological function that coyotes, granted, they don't do the best of job, but they're starting to do that job. So the answer is complex. I know that that answer is a cop out, but I I probably would discourage coyotes from moving all the way down and through South America. They probably could, but what that means for our communities and ecosystems in the future, I don't know. Hopefully, maybe there would be some rapid mutations and maybe those animals will persist really, really well. But also we have to consider the fact that climate change means that their ecological niches may also disappear while they're being hammered by coyotes. So they're fighting a war on two fronts. Oh, three fronts, because they also have to face deforestation from people. So we got to Yeah, it, it gets really sticky really quick. We got a lot to sort out. Um, yeah. Another another question here. Um, are there any particular are there any particular animals that you've been especially excited to see on camera? I mean, I know for myself, the first time I saw a bobcat was just unforgettable in the wild. It's 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 surreal. Yeah. And I think that a lot of people can remember those really deep connect those deep and kind of meaningful connections that they have when they see wildlife doing what wildlife does best. You mentioned earlier that people are. Um, a, a notice uh, maybe that they're, they're at home they're maybe they're getting a bird feeder maybe they're just yep. looking around at what's going at the mall for you what's kind of the rarest or the the most informative of the cutest what do you get excited about when you see on a camera trap sure uh that's a that's a two-part question because there are two species that have tied for me um that i've seen in colorado but there's an allegory here for the pacific northwest the first is american mink um, they are in our area. They aren't that particularly common, but they have some of the most interesting behaviors and they're adorable. Um, when I did some work in Colorado, when we had camera traps up, we caught a few American mink photos of mink catching rats. And the rats are almost as big as the mink, but the mink are solid. I mean, they're they're just they're they're these cute little balls of predatory efficiency. Um, so they're they're one A. The one B is mountain lions. That is that is my holy grail. That is what I'm hoping to catch and see. We have not got a mountain lion on camera yet. I would love to see a mountain lion in Pierce County. I would love it even better if we saw a mountain lion in Point Defiance Park. I doubt we will, but man, that would be cool. I mean, if we saw even for our Seattle partners, uh, uh, a cougar mountain lion anywhere inside the downtown region, that would be bonkers. Or even in like say West Seattle, right? Um, that's, that's the elusive like, oh snap, we just caught a mountain lion in some of the most urbanized areas. It rarely, rarely happens. Um, if you're in LA, it happens like all the time, like, you know, whatever, LA. Uh, but here, it rarely happens. So that's that's my holy grail right there is the mountain lion. Yeah. I know a lot of folks in North Carolina uh, where, where I lived previously have been <laughs> saying that they've seen mountain lions. I don't know. I don't know if those are just uh, some some tall tales there. Um, yeah. Speaking of which, how many, you talked about animals coming into the city a mountain lion coming into King County would, would be bananas, but yeah. how many animals do we need in a city? Should we be encouraging more? Uh, the, the answer is it's, it's specific to the city. Um, and nobody has ever actually observed that because of the fact that we imagine that species could live at higher abundances if they weren't in cities, which isn't always the case because food resources are stable in cities. So in fact, what you see is quite the opposite. In some instances, for some species, their abundances are greater in cities than they would be in say rural or more what we consider natural environments. 
Um, there is no right answer to how many species or how many of each species we should have. The real goal should be the diversity of species. So what is sometimes a problem for, for cities, especially those that are incredibly built up, is that they have certain species that exert what's known as priority effects. Essentially, they get into an area, they colonize it really quickly, and then nobody else can get in. What we need is the ability to have an array of different species in which you have very intact guilds of species. So everything from predators to prey, to parasites and pathogens, fungi to plants, all of the panacea of life that used to potentially exist before the city was built. Now, mind you, we're not gonna be able to get all animals back into the area. So for instance, we're not going to get badgers into Tacoma or Seattle. We're not. It's just that's not reasonable. But to be able to keep raccoons and create systems that say have beavers and mink and coyotes, that's possible, right? And that at least maintains a little bit of ecological function. So it's a case by case basis. And really, the more species you have, the better. That should be the rule of thumb. So more species and biodiversity is better than just having loads of Seattle rats. Right. Okay. Um, got time for maybe two more questions here. Another, another, another recommendation one. Can you recommend local organizations for someone to volunteer um, to get involved in this type of work, um, work that incorporates environmental justice and sustainability? Absolutely. So of course, the first go-tos are always the zoo, right? So zoos are great educational resources and institutions that do extraordinary work with community engagement. Woodland Park Zoo, Point to Find Zoo and Aquarium. Those should be your first two stops on this road. The next few stops for those of you that are at home observing social distancing, paying attention to public health and being responsible about it, iNaturalist is a good stop. So iNaturalist is a good resource for you to go online and observe things like plants, birds, insects, mammals, you name it, you can observe it. Mind you, you do have to create a login to be able to get an iNaturalist ID in order to tag all of the animals that you see and all of the plants that you see, but that's another good resource. Another good resource that was created by Woodland Park Zoo, that Woodland Park Zoo and Point Defined Zoo and Aquarium are collaborating on, right? That we're working on together as a Seattle carnivore spotter. So for those of you that haven't heard of the Seattle carnivore spotter, it is essentially a standalone web-based design that allows you to ID what type of animal you saw, where you saw it, and what your type of interaction was. I Guarantee you, if you were to go on it right now, you'd see thousands upon thousands of posts of where the animals are located. And you can imagine that there are certain gaps in the data. Those gaps, not coincidentally, respond to socioeconomic demographics. So if you're somebody who's really interested in say, spotting carnivores and you wanna walk around a neighborhood, right? Or you know people that are in these different socio demographic areas, tap them and say like, hey, have you heard of Seattle Car Urban Carnivore Spotter? I bet you would wanna to contribute to that. Um, Zooniverse is also a good resource. I should mention that we, as the Grit City Carnivore Project have not brought online our project yet, but that is our soon to launch summer project is to get many of our photos, right? Our 50,000 plus photos all onto Zooniverse for people to tag and to see and to actually like see like, oh snap, you got, you got more baby animals, you got baby coyotes, you got baby raccoons, we got all the babies. So if you wanna tag some babies, we got you. Um, so those are, those are a few of the resources, certainly for the wildlife side of things, for many of say the environmental justice narratives, resources, discourses that you can get involved in. Um, there are the Tacoma Urban Leagues that you can be a part of, whether Seattle or Tacoma, there are several different organizations that work specifically on diversity and inclusion and sustainability. I should mention um, Sean Watts Consulting, one of my colleagues that I've been working with 
who does a lot of work in that realm and in that in that um, just general sphere. There are many Seattle Seattleites, right, that do a lot of work around, say, like the environmental justice forum. So we just had that about three weeks ago, um, and I spoke at that as well. Um, so that's another kind of annual resource you can go to. The annual um, Green Summit and uh, the South Sound happens again every year. Just recently spoke at that as well. We still held, held it virtually. I imagine they're gonna do the same for the sixth annual South Sound um, Green Sustainability Expo. And any sustainability expo that you see, right? I imagine has a lot of that information as well. I probably could ramble on and on and on about all of the resources. That's a good way to start. And mm -hmm. if you have no other idea of like, man, I wanna start, but maybe even I don't wanna start just in the region. I just wanna see what's happening generally. You can go to Lincoln Park Zoo's website and check out the Urban Wildlife Information Network. And that would give you a lot of resources as well into what we're doing. Okay, well, thank you so much. Got time for one final question and I'm gonna shamelessly plug our upcoming event, which is on uh, sniffer dogs, sniffing out whale scat so that those uh, marine biologists can, can better understand life in our oceans. What can we learn from animal scat? What are some interesting things that folks, it's the, it's the, it's the gross side of science. What can you <laughs> learn from animal scat? Why is it important? Right, I'm glad you asked me this question because I am academically raised as a behavioral endocrinologist. So that means I study how behavior and hormones influence each other and vice versa. And the best way sometimes to do that non-invasively is not by collecting blood or urine or saliva, but actually measuring the hormones in the poop, right? So in SCAT, we get a really good analysis of that animal's hormones. So how stressed the animal was, how much testosterone that was, was in that animal circulating um, system, um, whether or not the animal was pregnant, um, how the animal is eating. If the animal has hypertension or diabetes, we can measure all of it, right? Just from a single sample of poop. Uh, we also, there's a world within a world. So for yeah. those of you, here's a Marvel plug right here, right? For those of you that love Ant-Man and, and talking about tardigrades and the microbiome and going real small on the quantum level. Well, you can, you too can be like Ant-Man and observe the microbiome of an animal through its scat. So the animal's microbiome, tell, and it should be mentioned here that the same is the case for people. If you observe the scat of an animal, it gives you the more or less bacterial composition, the microbiome of that particular animal. And it tells you how healthy they are, what they're eating, which you can do that as well just by looking at the bones and the hair and picking that out from the scat. I like to think the microbiome is way more interesting because especially in cities, and this, is start, this research is starting to skyrocket. We're also trying to do some work on the microbiome and hormones and behavior is how they're all connected. And, and animals that tend to eat more anthropogenic foods have different microbiome signatures in house sparrows and a few other species compared to say rural individuals. What that means is oftentimes you have a large proportion of certain classes of microbiomes that result in greater fat stores higher sugar stores, which results in things like hypertension, diabetes, cardiac complications, which says, again, ecosystem sentinels, a lot about us. Our diet is terrible and the animals are feeling the same thing. And we can tell all of that just through their poop. So one, we can tell how stressed an animal is. Two, we can tell what they're eating. Three, we can tell their microbiome content and four, that then reflects back on us to say like, oh man, maybe we, we should think about not eating so much junk food. <laughs> Chris, that is a lot of food for thought. Um, yeah, yeah. Really, <laughs> a heartfelt thank you, Chris. Uh, we really appreciate you sharing your time, your expertise, your experiences with all of us today. Um, I know I speak for everyone who's watching saying thank you. That, that was tremendous. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you all for having me. And um, of course, enjoy nature. Definitely, definitely enjoy nature. It's for everybody. Ditto. Um, thank you everyone who's been watching from home for joining us for all of your thoughtful questions. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed today's event. Please send us your feedback by filling out a short survey. We'll email that to everyone who's registered. It's very brief. 
Um, also, if you enjoyed tonight's talk, please share it with friends and family. This presentation is going to be saved on Paxi's YouTube page. So if you know someone who would benefit from listening to this conversation today, please do. Remember to sign up for our e-newsletter at paxi.org forward slash SITC. That's for Science in the City. And donate to the Pacific Science Center at paxi.org forward slash support. We will be back at the same time and the same place next Tuesday, June the 16th at 7 p.m. We'll be discussing the health of our oceans, nature documentaries, and as you've just heard, we will be diving into whale poop. Thank you for joining us again, and we will look forward to seeing you again soon. So bye for now. <laughs>